What would you cite as the most important reason for your early success with small amounts of capital? And given hindsight today, what might you have done to improve your strategy with these small funds? Yeah, well, I had a great teacher. I had exceptional focus. And I had the right sort of uh, uh, emotional uh, qualities that that would help me in being an investor. I enjoyed the game. I mean, if it, you know, it, it's just about, you know, hard enough to be interesting, but not so, so hard as to be beyond the capabilities of people understanding it. And, and that's kind of the way this game is. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like Henry Singleton kind of questions he took on. It's, a, it, it's, it's actually a pretty easy game, and it does require a certain uh, emotional stability uh, and I, I went at it, you know, hammer and tong. I, <laughs> I went through the manuals and everything, but I was enjoying when I, when I did it. And, and, and like I say, I started out between ages seven and about 19. I had that same enthusiasm, but I didn't really have any guiding principle. And then I ran into the intelligent investor and Ben Graham and, 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 uh, and then at that point, I was able to take all this energy and everything, uh, enthusiasm for it, and, and, and now I had a philosophy that uh, uh, made a lot of sense, total sense, and I found that I could employ, and so the game became even more fun. But it wasn't, wasn't really more complicated than that. Charlie? Well, I, I don't have anything to add. I do think that that it's an easy game if somebody has the temperament for it and keeps at it because he likes it and is interesting, interested in it. I have a problem that Warren has less of. I don't like being too much an example to people who want to get rich by being shrewd and buying and passively holding securities. I don't think that's enough of a life. Rip. If you wrest a fortune from life by being shrewder than other people and buying little pieces of paper, uh, I don't think that's an adequate contribution in exchange for what you're taking. So, so I like it when you're investing money for an endowment or a pension fund or your relatives or something, but, but I, I never considered it enough of a life to merely be shrewd and picking stocks and passively holding them. Yeah, running Berkshire has been far, far more fun than running, in my case, Buffett Partnership or, or, or just an investment fund. I mean, that... You'd see, be less of a man. If you'd be, run that partnership... It'd be a crazy way to go through life. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, I, uh, Berkshire is incredibly more satisfying. So if you're good at just investing your own money, uh, I hope you'll morph into doing something more. Warren, Charlie, the higher education system has expanded, covering almost everyone who would like to receive a college education. This demand has translated into rising college cost. As a high school junior, I'm looking at prestigious institutions such as UPenn, Villanova, NYU, Fordham, and Boston University. On the other hand, my parents are experiencing sticker shock. All of these schools have a sticker price of over $60,000, with some students, as shown in a businessinsider.com article, ha can pay over $70,000, as the case at NYU. How will the average American family be able to pay this in the future? And more importantly, how do you two feel about this? Charlie? Well, the average American family does it by going to less expensive places and getting massive subsidies from the expensive places. If, if we had to give our college education to only people who could write cash checks for sixty or $70,000 a year, we wouldn't have that many college no. students. So most people are paying less or getting subsidies. And, and, uh, but I think it is a big problem that education has just kept raising the price, raising the price, raising the price. And they say, but college-educated people do better. <laughs> it's a big bargain. 
but maybe they do better because they were better to start with yeah. before they ever went to college. Yeah. And they never tell you that. It, and, it's a ridiculous argument. And, yeah. and, and, and so, I think that's one of the silliest statistics that they publish. I mean, to, to say that a college education is worth X because people that go to college earn this much more than the ones that don't. You're talking about two different universes and to attribute the entire difference to the one variable that they went to college as opposed to the difference between the people who want to go to college and have the ability to get into college. It, it, it's a completely nutty it's a fraud. and seventy percent of the people believe in it. So it <laughs> gives you a certain hesitation about relying on your fellow man. <laughs> so I think most people just have to struggle through with the system the way it is. There's a big tendency to have prices rise to what can be collected. And people just rationalize that the service is worth it. And I think a lot of that has happened in education. And, and of course, a lot is taught in higher education that isn't very useful to the people who are, who are learning it. And of course, all of those people would never learn much from anything. So it's really wasting your time. And, and that's just the way it works. So I think there's a lot wrong. What I noticed that was very interesting is that when the Great Recession came, every successful university in America was horribly overstaffed, and they all behaved just like 3G. They all, with a shortage of money, laid off a lot of people. And the net result is they all worked better when it was all over with the people gone. And so this right-sizing is, is not all bad. I don't think there's a college in America that wants to go back to its old habits. And, uh, but you put your finger on, it is a real problem to look at those sticker shocks. And it's like any other problem in life. You, you have just to figure out your best option and just live with it. We can't change Villanova or Fordham. They're gonna do what they're gonna do. And, and as long as it works, they'll keep raising the prices. And it'll keep working. Yes. Um, and that's pretty much the way the, the system works. When it really gets awful, there's finally a rebellion. In my place in Los Angeles, the little traffic a accident got so, cost too much to everybody because of so much fraud in the chiropractors and some of the plaintiff's attorneys and so on. And finally, the little accidents were costing so much that, that they worried about the guy who lived in a tough neighborhood would, couldn't afford to drive out of it to get a job. And, and the auto insurance companies thought, my God, if the price is going up like this, they'll have legislation creating state auto insurance or something. So the net result is they put the plaintiff's attorneys to trial in every case, and that fixed it. And maybe something like that will happen in higher education. But without some big incentive, I think higher education will just keep raising the price. On that cheerful note, yeah. uh, we'll move to station two. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. My name is Brandon Chen. I'm from Taipei, Taiwan. My question is, uh, China is undergoing a number of structural changes. What do you, when you take the pulse of the Chinese economy, what do you read and what advice would you give? Thank you. Charlie's the China expert. I think well, China. I think China is going to do very fine over a period of time. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, a big fan for what's happening in China. And as a matter of fact, I've just ordered prepared a bust of Lee Kuan Yew, the recently deceased prime minister of ex prime minister of Singapore, because I think he's contributed so much to fixing first Singapore and then China. And, and one of the things Lee Kuan Yew did in China was, in Singapore, was just stop the corruption, including cashiering some of his close friends. And China's doing the same thing. And I consider it the smartest damn thing I've seen a big country do in a long, long time. And, and I think that to, to, it's hard to set the proper example if the leading political rulers are kleptocrats. You, know, you don't want to be run by a den of thieves. You, you want responsible people. And what Lee Kuan Yew did is he paid the civil servants 
way better and recruited very good people. And he just created a better system. And he, of course, China is widely copying him. And, uh, and it's a wonderful thing they're doing. So I'm very high on what's going on in China. And I think it's, I think it's very likely to work. If you, you, they've actually shot a few people. That really gets people's attention. <laughs> Now we're yeah. starting to get some practical advice here. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what has happened in China, you know, over the last 40 or so years? I mean, I, I, it just strikes me as just totally miraculous. I don't think, I, I would not have believed that a country could move so far so fast, a country that size, particularly so far so fast. And it's, it's, it's it been- It never happened before in the history of the world that a company so big had come so far. When I was a little boy, 80% of the population of China was illiterate and mired in subsistence, poverty, and agriculture. Now just th- and they've been through horrible wars and look at them. It's one of the most remarkable achievements in the history of the earth. And it, a few people made an extreme contribution to it, including this, this Chinese politician in Singapore. And I give the Communist Party a lot of credit for for uh, copying Lee Kuan Yew. That's all Berkshire does is to copy the right people. Yeah. Yeah, in 1790, the United States had four million people. China had 290 million people. They were just as smart as we were. They worked as hard, similar climate, similar soil, and for 200, close to 200 years, you know, the United States went with those 4 million people to close to 25% of the world's GDP, and China really didn't go anyplace. And then those same people in 40 years, and they're not working harder now than they were 40 years ago. They're not smarter now than they were 40 years ago in terms of the basic intelligence. And just look at what's been accomplished. I mean, it does show you the human potential when you find a system that unleashes it. And we found a system that unleashed human potential uh, a couple hundred years ago, and they found a system that unleashed human potential 40 or 50 years ago. And, you know, when you see that example, you know, it has to have a powerful effect on what happens in the future. And uh, it's, 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 it's just amazing that you could have people go nowhere basically in their lives for centuries and then just it explodes and it it, it just blows me away to to see it and you make it it's the same human beings but but they've they found a way to to unlock their potential and I congratulate them for it and as Charlie said earlier China and the United States are going to be the superpowers for as far as the eye can see and it is it is really good for us in my view, that the Chinese have found the way to unlock their potential. And I think it's imperative for two countries with nuclear weapons that in this kind of world that they figure out ways to see the virtues in each other rather than the the flaws. We'll have plenty of disagreements with the Chinese and they will with us, but we ought to remember that on balance, we're both better off if the other one's doing well. Just my own view. Uh my name is John Boxtos. I'm from South Dartmouth, Massachusetts. My question was regarding an interview that you gave Mr. Buffett several years ago. Uh, you made a very interesting point. It was about the old Wall Street Journal, if you will, the one before it was purchased by News Corp. You mentioned in the interview that the Wall Street Journal, at some point in the past, had very significant competitive advantages, but a number of them were largely unrealized. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that, what the advantages were, how they were unrealized, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, well, Dow Jones, which owned the Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, in the in the 60s uh, and 70s, going into the area, into the era of the enormous spread of financial information and value of financial information, you know, they basically they owned the field. They had the, they had the news ticker, and uh, they had the journal, which 
you know, anybody interested in finance in the country uh, identified with. And uh, they, starting with that in what would be the, an incredible growth industry, finance, uh, you know, for the next 30 or 40 years, they, they uh, I forget a couple of those ventures they went into and they bought a chain of small newspapers, uh, I remember one time, and they just totally missed uh, what was going to happen. You know, here, here comes Michael Bloomberg and, you know, takes away financial information. I mean, they, they had such an advantage and uh, they didn't really see uh, various areas that they could have pursued which it could have turned that company into something worth many hundreds of billions of dollars in all probability. And, uh, you know, they had a situation where a family owned it and a lawyer essentially controlled the family, uh, family's behavior, and they were sitting pretty, you know, they, they were all getting dividends, but there was nobody there with any imagination as to what could be done in the financial field. So starting with this position, they were a trusted name, they were in every Every, every brokerage firm in the country with the, with the news ticker. I mean, I went to Walter Annenberg's house one time and he had the Dow Jones ticker there. It, it, it just, it, or the news, news ticker. And it, it, it was, they couldn't have been in a better place. They couldn't have started with a stronger position. They had a, they had a very good balance sheet uh, and they just let the world pass them by. Uh, now Rupert is, is, is changing it into a different newspaper. He's going into He's basically going into competition with the New or has gone into competition with the New York Times. So he is, but that's the game he likes, and uh, and it makes for a very interesting competitive situation. Charlie, well, they did end up with six or seven billion dollars, so they may have blown their opportunities, but they they didn't destroy their fortune. If you'd had the hand, if Tom Murphy had had the hand, oh yeah. <laughs> It would have been in the hundreds of billions, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if we had had that hand. We would well, have I'm not so, so sure well about that. I'm talking about Murph. <laughs> there were a lot of opportunities there. Well, I think even Murph is more like us than he is like Bill Gates. No. <laughs> I'm not sure where that goes, but. <laughs> well, but. <laughs> I think it's hard to invent he's, new, he's more our entirely age. new new modalities and and so on. I think Bill would have done very well with Dow Jones too. Yes, he might, he yeah. might have done better than yeah. I'd like to buy into that retroactively. Yeah. 